Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you for this glorious day that you've made, Lord, and we thank you for your living word, Lord, that can speak to each one of us. It's amazing how you can, you can speak to each one of us where we're at in our relationship with you, in our time with this, with our day-to-day stuff, Lord, you can speak to us. So we pray now that you'd send your Holy Spirit, pray that you'd use Pastor Izzy, Lord, to speak to us, Lord, the sheep of your pasture. You're the good shepherd, Lord, and we just pray now that we would, we would be that clay in your hands, Lord. We'd be moldable and let you, let you work a work in us. We ask that now in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. 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 Well, guys, good morning, and uh, welcome to Church on the Beach, but I see a, a fan going like this. That means we need to have our prayer warriors pray for more air conditioning to come from the Lord, a breeze that would blow through here. Anyone uh, give an amen for that prayer besides uh, the sweaty pastor up front? That, um, we, we, what? The wind is supposed it's supposed to be picking up. Lord, send that breeze and the, send the blowing of your spirit to refresh our, our spirits as we look into your word. Yep. Jan goes, see, it's working already. For those that are watching this on YouTube, the breeze is actually picking up as we pray. So, it's nice that we have a God. We just sang the psalm this morning, Psalm 18, the verse, uh, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. And when you call on the Lord, what does it say the scripture says? So shall you be saved from your enemies. So he will hear your cry and he will answer if it goes on to say in that very psalm. So when, whenever you have troubles, I mean, wh- what better place to come together and cry out to the Lord than at church. You know, you go to church and like, here I am, Lord, I need your help. And, uh, you know, today we're, we, we look in church history. This is um, 500 years ago. Today is uh, Reformation Sunday and the Lutheran, um, Martin Luther nailed to the front of the Catholic Church, the, uh, not, like I think it's 94 point edicts of things that were, what, what the Catholic Church had veered away from the faith. You know, the Catholic Church had been since the beginning. Um, in the early days, the church was called the way. And if you belong to the way, as we read in Acts 24, when Paul was accused of belonging to the way. Remember, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. And what? No man gets to the Father except through me. And so the early church was called the way. The, you know, people say, what, what way? The way to God. You know, Jesus became the way to God so we could get to God. And um, the, the word Catholic uh, is actually from the Latin, means universal answer. It's the equivalent in, in Latin to the word that was used in the Hebrew for the way. So some people don't know this stuff. I like language, so to me it's interesting and, you know, it helps me fill in a lot of gaps because I didn't grow up speaking English from my first language, so... It's kind of nice to have that ability to switch between languages. But if you don't have that, let me just tell you that the church, like now the, the Catholic church as we know it today, didn't actually form until about 300 years after Christ. 300 A.D. is when they actually made their first little um, articles, we'll say, of incorporation. That's the easy way to do it. I, mean, I don't want to over church historyize you, but just so you know, they, they start around 300 A.D. And by the time that, you know, you come to where Martin Luther is 500 years ago, he's going, um, there's some problems have crept into this Catholic church that wasn't what Jesus taught. And so he put up these edicts, like, you know, praying to the priest and, and confessing to the priest your sins when it says that we have one priest, one high priest. Who's the high priest that the Bible tells us we have? Jesus, right. And he's the great go-between between God and man. It, it, it says there's only one go-between, one mediator. In First Timothy we read, and that's Christ Jesus. And so Luther posted that 500, 500 can you believe that? 500 years ago, he, went, he stood up and said, this isn't right. You're not supposed to pray to Mary. You're not supposed to. You're not supposed. You're supposed to pray to God, in Christ's name. He's the. He's the hotline, so to speak. He's the go-between. He's what connects us to God. And God did all these things. And He said we veered from that. 
And so it became what was referred to as the Great Reformation, you know, reforming the church. Because sometimes the church needs to be reformed back to what it was meant to be in the image of what Jesus established. And so, you know, Jesus even taught this. He said the old wineskins don't like the new wine because it just causes them to burst. So the, the Spirit of God moves into new wineskins so that they can stretch and expand with that whole, that whole growth process. And, and, you know, the Lord had to do that. And people don't like me to point this out. I grew up in, in coming to the Lord in Calvary Chapel, a movement that was like this. People were like, those are the hippies getting saved and people that don't usually go to church, you know. And, and uh, it was kind of, you know, they, they had the pastor and, the, and there was people actually sitting barefoot on the floors and, and up and down the aisles, just crammed in to hear this pastor, this guy, Pastor Chuck Smith. And he was, you know, for those of you who never heard Pastor Chuck speak, um, I have great, great respect for this man, but he could speak slower than anyone I know and still keep everyone listening. I don't know how he did it. I mean, he had a gift. He was like the most relaxed, chill. Uh, any of you heard Pastor Chuck Smith teach the Bible? He, he teaches chapter by chapter, verse by verse. He's, he's who modeled to me that, that, that style of teaching, of just expository teaching through the Word. And he, he stood behind a pulpit and it, it was, you know, it was a big pulpit, and he was a big man. And he would put the Bible out and put his watch there, and he would lean on the pulpit, and, and he would stand there, and he wouldn't move. And I, I couldn't teach like that because, you know, I'm Italian, and there's a problem with holding my hands still. It's like, you know, you know the joke, how to shut up an Italian, tie his hands behind his back. He can't, he can't talk anymore. You have to be able to move. And this guy could stand still for 90 minutes. And preach the word. Just solid Bible study. Really good. And quiet and calming. And everyone was just hanging there. And hippies were all over the floor and, and, and barefooted. And they, they didn't have really official buildings. They were building buildings. From, they went from a tent, a circus tent, to this building. They finally got the building. And then they, they um, when they got enough money, they put new carpet in. And the elders came to Chuck and said, hey, these hippies are coming in with their bare feet and they're soiling the carpet. And, and, and you got to make some rules, tell them to wear shoes. And, and you know, I love Chuck. Has anyone heard what Chuck Smith's answer was to the, to the board? He said, wait, last week the hippies were welcome when we didn't have carpet. We just had concrete floor. But this week they're not welcome because we got carpet. He said, okay, go tear out the carpet. And the board went, what? Tear it out. You, you made the building more important than the people. You miss, you're missing the point. We're, we're here for the people. And so they got the point. They're like, all right, all right. But it's going to have to be cleaned all the time. And they're soiling it. And Chuck's like, who cares? It's about people. Today I want to show you in 1 Corinthians where we've been studying that Paul the Apostle also understood that the church is about the people. It's not about our perfection either. It's about God's work in us. And we just got through the portion of, of the scriptures here. In 1 Corinthians, if you would turn with me to chapter 6, we saw Paul telling the church at Corinth that he said that we were, we were a people that, well, we came with sin. And he, he said this last week, we, we read from verses 9 to 11, where we're going to pick up today. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? He said, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. He says, but you were washed, and you were, but you were, you were sanctified, and but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the spirit of our God. He says, you know, in the church of Corinth, you remember the church history, they were in a very carnal society there in Corinth, and they were, they were actually known as the, the ancient world of, like the Las Vegas of the ancient, the red light district of Las Vegas of the ancient world. They were, if you call someone a Corinthian, it was a knock. 
You were not saying something nice about him. You're saying, you know, you come from a real reprobate culture, really perverse, and, and anything real lewd, anything goes. And, and, and Paul's writing to the church there, and he's telling them that don't forget, the unrighteous don't get to inherit the kingdom of God. But before you get too high on your high horse and think, yeah, those guys don't get to, he says, and such were some of you. You know, like, don't forget where we came from. We, we, none, none of us are perfect. He says, we all come from whatever area of sin that we came to Christ. And he says, but, now this but right here, there's three of them. I don't know, would you look with me at verse 11? I said we'd pick up here today. He says, but, but some of you, he says, such were some of you, but you were washed. And but you were sanctified. And but. See, we were those things, but, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. We were those things. Now, if the church would remember this, I think that people who come from outside the church to hang out with us, if they, they could catch that we were those very things, we, we struggled with those very sins, but... They, they might be able to actually, you know, want the gospel if they could hear these three buts. And I want to go over each one in depth this morning before we continue into this chapter. Because if you, if you don't actually let this part sink into your being, you kind of turn into one of those snooty, I'm better than everyone else Christians. Have any of you ever run into them? No, I didn't say uh, are any of you them because I know it's not in our group. But, but y you know, sometimes... You run into these Christians that they're the ones that are, we are so much better than everyone else on the planet, including all the other groups of Christians, like as if they have the exclusive on, on the Lord. When, I mean, Luther was going, hey, you Catholics, you don't have the exclusive. God is universal. Isn't that what Catholic means? Universal answer? I mean, the answer for everyone, the way for everyone, not the way just for these guys, it's for everyone. And so, this is what it comes down to. It comes down to these three buts. But first, we were washed. Now, I love the washing that the Lord does for us. In fact, would you guys turn with me to Isaiah? Isaiah, we, we use this, there's a song that we sing from Isaiah, the first chapter. Isaiah chapter 1, a beautiful chapter of Scripture. If you've never read it, this is the prophet Isaiah prophesying. And he says some words that are, I don't know if it, how many of you read chapter 1 of Isaiah before? It's a pretty cool chapter. I mean, it's the chapter that says, Though our sin be as scarlet, he washes us, he makes us white as what? As snow. This is, that's verse 18 of this, of this um, beautiful passage of scripture. Though our sins would be as deep as scarlet, the Lord, the Lord washes us white as snow. Now, when Isaiah writes this, he doesn't say such nice things. He's a prophet. And he's prophesying and he says, he actually, listen to this. Would you back up with me just a few verses before verse 18? Go back to verse 10. Listen to this. He said, um, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom, and give ear to the instructions of our God, you peoples of Gomorrah. He said, he says, what are your, your multiplied sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and of, of, uh, of, fat, uh, uh, of the fed cattle. I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls or lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, he says, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? He says, you bring your worthless offerings. He, the Lord says, bring your worthless offerings no longer. Your incense offerings are an abomination to me. Your new moons and your Sabbaths and the callings of your assemblies. I cannot endure the iniquity of this solemn assembly. He says, I hate your new moon festivals. I hate your appointed feasts. They become a burden to me and I am weary of bearing them. So when you spread out your hand in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, even though you multiply your prayers, you say the same prayer over and over and over. I will not listen to you. Your hands are covered with blood. He says, wash yourself and make yourself clean. Remove the evil from the evil deeds from my sight and cease to do evil. 
Learn to do good. Seek justice. Reprove the ruthless and defend the orphan and plead for the widow. Now, when he says this, he, you know, some people, if you jump in right here, you're going to think he's talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, but Sodom and Gomorrah, they were judged like 2065 B.C. And if you don't know this, Isaiah, <laughs> Isaiah is alive a lot later. You know, he's like, um, he, he comes like in the 700s around there, B.C. So it, it's, a, it's a bit of time has passed since He's not actually talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, that, the literal one that God destroyed. Who's he talking about? Who, who knows? Who's read the first part of this chapter? Look back at the very beginning and see who the word of the Lord was against through this prophet Isaiah. Who was he actually addressing at this time? Some of you already know I'm cheating, but Judah, right? The, the, the kingdom of Israel. He says, you guys, O Israel, this is the vision. Look at verse 1. I'll just... Show it to you. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, concerning Judah and Jerusalem, which he saw during the reign of Uzziah, Jothan and Ahaz and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. And the Lord spoke, and he actually called. Now, this is not a nice compliment. If God is calling Jerusalem and Judah, that's where his chosen peoples, quote, are supposed to be. He's calling them Sodom and Gomorrah by verse 10. What's it say about how spiritual they are at this point? I mean, they're doing really good, right? They're walking right up. Just No, they were like full out sinning. And the Lord is, the, I, I find it really interesting how the Lord, when, when men are in the depths of their depravity, in the most deepest place of sin, God comes in and says, I'm going to wash you. I'm going to wash you, in fact, I'm going to wash you white, whiter than snow. Because your, your, your sin is stained, like, I mean, worse than scarlet. You, you're bloodied. Your, your sin has brought just the, the, the most darkest mark on your soul. And God goes, well, good thing I can do that. I can wash away sin when, uh, when you know, to God, he doesn't go, oh, no, it's too big. He said, I didn't, I didn't plan on this. Did you know that some of these guys fornicated? And some of these guys were, were liars? And some of these guys, I mean, at Corinth? I got news for you. Israel did all the same sins. If you read the prophets, they tell on the, on the nation of Israel, they did not do everything right. They blew it left and right. And, and yet, Paul recognized that there are those, even Judaizers, he called them, that acted like this. I'm so much better than all those guys. You know, I'm, I'm way above. The, and Jesus even told a parable. Remember about the Pharisee? He said there was two men. They went up to the temple to pray. And one man, he was, he was a sinner. He, he fell on his face. He, he put the dust of the earth over his head and said, Lord, I'm lower than the dust. Forgive me. I'm just but a man and I, I need your forgiveness. And the other, the religious dude, he stood up there. Oh, God, I thank thee that I am not like this sinner over here. I pay tithes and all they get. I do. I am so great. I do. You know, and Jesus asked a question. Which one of these two men went back from the temple justified in the sight of the Lord? Which one did God accept their prayer? The guy who was all self-righteous or the one who said, God, you make me righteous? You forgive me. You, f you wash me. See, because God, if we, wouldn't, if we would just stick to the message, is God in the washing business of our souls? Like, does he do a good job cleaning us up when we say, Lord, forgive me? What's it say in 1 John 1, 9? If I confess my sins, God is faithful and just to forgive me my sin and to what? Cleanse, wash to wash me of all unrighteousness. If, if people could just hear what a great God we have, man, he can wash. Even though we did do some of those bad things, can he wash those things clean from us? Does he, how, how much does the Lord forgive us anyway? Does he go, oh, I'll forgive you a little uh, on a good day, if I'm in a good mood? I mean, some people, because maybe they have a relative that that's how they treated them, like, you know, if you were raised in my Sicilian family, you would know 
that there are certain times if you asked your uncle for forgiveness, if you broke something of his, you had to be careful when you told him. Told him on a bad day, it was going to be over. But if you caught him on a really good day, he might go, all right, I forgive you a little, but it's going to cost you, and I'm never going to forget. Is that really what forgiveness is like with the Lord? That might be how men say they forgive, but that's not how the Lord forgives. When the Lord forgives, he says, you confess your sin to me. I'm faithful. I'm just. I forgive you, and I cleanse you of all unrighteousness. I wash you clean. Now, how about the person who's struggling, and they can't go forward in life because they know that they've blown it in their past? Have you ever had a friend that is stuck in their past? And you try to get them on today with you. You're like, hey, could you forget about that for a little bit? Let's live right here where we're, you know, that was a long, it could be, you're like, when did that happen? 25 years ago. Okay, I think we sufficiently visited it. Let's move on. Nope, I can't go anywhere forward. I'm stuck. And because they don't hear the message about what Paul's saying here to the Corinthian church, but you were washed. In other words, that's been washed away. The scripture says as far as east is from west in a straight line. That's how far God takes your sin and removes it from you. Infinity. It's gone. Never to be remembered again. Cast into the sea of what? Forgetfulness, the scripture says. Hey, I got visual aid. Look out there. Think a really deep spot. No one's going to find it. Into the sea of forgetfulness. That's when you ask God, forgive me. He goes, done. Takes that thing, that mark against you, and throws it into the deepest place, never to be brought up again. Now that is good news. And at church, especially a church like at Corinth where they had struggled with a carnal society all around them, and some of them came from that carnal background. If you want the church to be healthy you know, that group of people there in that culture. Do we, do we have any of that carnality around us today? I mean, I feel like scoot over, Corinth. We got America, you know? I mean, seriously, we're going to have to apologize to Babylon pretty soon and Sodom and Gomorrah and the way we're... I mean, really, we, we don't, we, we're doing the same sins what the, the prophet said they were doing. And... The thing is, is if we can't herald the message that Paul is saying in verse 11, you should probably highlight this, by the way, in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. This part is really important that we, that we let it sink in. But we were washed. See, because the beginning of us moving forward is understanding how complete God is at washing away the mistakes of our past. Have any of you ever been around someone who always throws your mistakes up in your face? I mean, don't, don't point at them, okay? That would not be nice if they're here. But the reality is, how does it make you feel when you have someone like that always throwing up your mistakes of your past? You're trying to move forward, and they're just going, but you did that. And you're like, I repented, but... Now, Paul here says, these guys did these things. But we should throw it up in their face just to remind them. Is that the first but? No, the first but is you were washed. So if God washed you, and how, cle- how complete does he wash? Sin is scarlet, white as snow. If God washes someone that clean, why should we remind them of their mistakes? They were washed. Nothing to remind you of. That's the past. It's done away. It's been cleansed. It's gone. Time to move on. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.